Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kelly Ostig. I'm a senior program officer for the Ocean Studies Board with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, and I'm also serve as the study director. For so thank you all for joining us this morning um, for the webinar on the report that was just released titled and Priorities in Ocean Drilling in Search of Earth's Past and Future. This is an interim product from the National Academy. Uh-oh, Kelly has frozen on us. Nope. She's disappeared. Um, am I still there? Yes, we can hear you again. You just were saying that this is an interim product. Interim product, wonderful, of the National Academy's Decadal Survey. Um, so you can download a copy of the report and other supporting materials at www.nap.edu. Um, a recording of this webinar will be available in the coming weeks on the National Academy's website. And so we'll put a link to both the report and the website in the chat momentarily. So for those joining us that are not familiar with the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, um, we are a private nonprofit institutions that provide independent objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. For each study, panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience, and they serve pro bono to carry out the study's statement of tasks. The reports that result from the study present the consensus view of the committee and must undergo external peer review before they're released, as did this report. As study director, I do want to take just a moment to extend an enormous thank you to our sponsor, the National Science Foundation, for sponsoring and entrusting us to do this important work. Thank you to our committee of dedicated volunteers for their endless hard work. Um, what we're presenting today is just one piece of information feeding into a compelling, innovative, and forward-looking research strategy for the next decade for all of ocean sciences. Thank you to our peer reviewers who provided excellent constructive feedback on the report, and thank you to the dozens of experts who shared their time and thoughts with the committee throughout the process, enriching our discussions and our end product. Um, we have several members of the committee with us here today to discuss the report. Um, before I turn it over to them, I just have a few uh, reminders. The first one is please note that this webinar is scheduled to last 60 minutes. Um, we'll start off with a presentation summarizing the report by the committee, and then we'll open it up to questions that you may have. We should have roughly 30 minutes for discussion um, after the presentation. To ask a question, um, simply click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. Um, you can submit a question at any time during the presentation. Um, so now I'd like to introduce the committee co-chairs who will be presenting today. Tuba Askenhaler will start off the presentation. She is Dean and Professor at Oregon State University's College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. Jim Yoder will talk through the second half of the presentation. Jim is Dean Emeritus of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and Professor Emeritus at the University of Rhode Island. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Tuba. Thank you very much, Kelly. Welcome, everybody. There's 129 of you. It's wonderful to see such interest in this work. Um, so I will start out by uh, letting you know uh, sort of the, the um, structure of our report. Um, we have four chapters, and I will talk you through the first two chapters of the report. And uh, Jim will talk you through the last two chapters of the report, and we'll actually um, spend more time on the latter parts of this report than the former parts. So let's dive right in. Um, the first portion of the report, we really try to make sure that uh, we place this work in the context of the overall um, task of this particular committee. And in order to do that, we started out with sort of a, um, a brief history of the accomplishments of this program. Um, and you, many of you are very familiar with this program, but not all of you may be. Um, so I um, want to start out by um, just reviewing the fact that the United States really has led the international science, scientific ocean drilling community since 1968. Uh, in particular, the Jody's resolution funded by the National Science Foundation and its operational, um, uh, operational team provide essential leadership. The Joides Resolution and its predecessor vessel um, 
have operational capabilities uh, that are unique for scientific ocean drilling. And so since the beginning of its operation in 1985, the Joides resolution has collected, um, and I was so surprised to learn this, 95% of the total core length for international scientific ocean drilling has been collected by the Joides resolution. And of course, those are free and openly available. Uh, access to samples and data from these cores are available to the international earth and ocean sciences community. Um, US scientists have also led the ocean drilling community in the conception and design uh, of drilling projects and in the dissemination of research results in terms of publications and, and also in terms of collaborations. So this is um, fantastic work. This work has led to scientific contributions to the discovery and understanding of many important earth processes, um, plate tectonics, formation, destruction of the ocean crust, and how these processes generate geohazards, um, the reconstruction of extreme greenhouse and ice house climates, um, identification of major extinctions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, as you all know, uh, scientific ocean drilling is now at a critical juncture. Um, the Joides resolution has not been renewed. The operation will end in 2024, as far as we know. Currently, there are no plans in place that we know of for a future dedicated U.S. drilling vessel. Meanwhile, the um, U.S. Scientific Ocean Drilling's international partners in Europe and Japan are jointly moving forward with plans for a new program phase uh, with berths um, on contracted vessels available to contributing members, member countries, the United States has not joined this consortium. Additionally, other countries, China, for example, is, is developing a new scientific ocean drilling program totally independently. Thus, the landscape for scientific ocean drilling really is changing and will change after 2024 for the U.S., um, so with the absence of a dedicated drilling vessel supported by the United States, the capacity for future scientific ocean drilling for the United States and its present international partners will likely be reduced, and we're estimating it will be reduced to approximately 10% of its current capacity. And so to illustrate this, here's an image um, from our report that indicates in black the parts of the ocean that will no longer be accessible for drilling without a riserless drilling cap capability. Further, uh, our committee heard a lot um, on the importance of a trained workforce skilled in planning, collecting, and analyzing and archiving scientific samples and data. Such a workforce has been and will continue to be critical um, to the future of ocean sciences in its entirety, and ocean drilling contributes very significantly to this goal. So some of the highly specialized expertise developed as part of the drilling program will likely be lost with a closure or even with a temporary cessation of US scientific ocean drilling. So without new infrastructure or sampling investments, participation of US scientists on expeditions will become limited. Access to new ocean drilling samples and data will be curtailed. Um, and these conditions will certainly impact progress globally, um, but specifically really uh, it, it impact US's leadership position. Um, and things that will be um, impacted include research on some of the pressing topics um, that ocean drilling has uh, addressed. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Well, the good news though, is that um, the National Science Foundation and the science community have put a lot of thought and resources into the next steps for the US role in scientific ocean drilling. This effort has included international and US identification of priority science areas, um, US and conceptualization of drilling vessel requirements through the publication of the 2050 science framework um, and the science mission requirements report in 2022, as well as a series of other workshops. Um, and additionally, of course, the National Science Foundation did ask the National Academies for, for Science, Engineering, and Medicine uh, to form a committee, this committee, um, on the 2025-2035 Decadal Survey of Ocean Sciences for the National Science Foundation. 
and um, asked this committee to produce and publish this consensus study serving as an interim report um, for a more encompassing full decadal survey uh, to come. Um, so we're hoping that this interim report provides timely and broad uh, perspective on critical research and infrastructure needed to answer the most compelling research questions that can be advanced only through scientific ocean drawings. All right, our statement of task, those of you who are familiar with the process of the academies know that this is a really important portion of the work is um, understanding and, and really dissecting our statement of task. This here, and you can read it more, more quickly than I can to you, this here is, was, is the committee's statement of task for the interim report. Um, uh, and, and as I just mentioned, this is a small portion of a much larger task to produce a decadal survey of ocean sciences for NSF. That report hopefully will be released in about a year from now. This statement of task guides the committee's work and the committee revisited the statement of task in this language often during our deliberations. Um, I will tell you, in order to get through peer review, the committee has to respond adequately to all of the components of the statement of task. Um, and equally as important, the committee must not work beyond the bounds of the statement of task. And we took our statement of task very seriously and really tried to adhere to it and answer the exact questions that we were asked to address. All right, um, our report is authored by 23 members of the committee. Um, they all represent diverse disciplines within ocean sciences. Um, they also represent a diversity of geography in terms of where they're located. Uh, career level, affiliation, and personal background. And um, I can personally tell you that the, this has been a very dedicated group of folks who really have tried to make sure that we hear the community and echo what we have heard. Okay, um, we thought um, the chapter two here is a primer. Um, you all know scientific ocean drilling well. Um, you are here, uh, so you know something about scientific ocean drilling. Uh, but we thought it was important to provide a primer on the program to explain its importance, its legacy, um, and provide a high level overview of how the program works uh, for an audience that is not as familiar, or maybe even completely unfamiliar with scientific ocean drilling. Uh, we won't go into the details today, but within chapter two, you can find some key terminology and concepts that are useful for understanding how ocean drilling, scientific ocean drilling works, um, a bit about the structure and how you get from an idea to an expedition. Uh, we provide a brief history of the program and we conclude with major accomplishments from its inception through 2013, when the first phase of IODP ended and that was about the time that the last decadal survey began. Um, and so accomplishments after that, we cover further down in the report. Um, and so this uh, um, discussion then leads us to our very first conclusion within our report. Um, uh, the report, by the way, has several conclusions, but we don't have a recommendation. Again, those of you who are familiar with the National Academy's process will know that a committee can issue recommendations, but we can do so in our final report. But we do have a few conclusions, um, in particular, a conclusion about how research supported by scientific ocean drilling has really fundamentally transformed our understanding of the planet, including some very, very important uh, mechanisms, plate tectonics, geohazards, reconstruction of past climates, et cetera. All right, with that, I will turn it over to my co-chair, Jim Yoder, to cover the remainder of the report. Take it away, Jim. Okay. So the next slide. So one of the things we were asked to do was to assess the progress also since DSOS, the first DSOS report, which was 10 years ago. And so the, it was summarized in the text, but also we made the a summary table. And if you track across, say, for the first example, the question asked by in the first DSOS report is, 
What are the rates, mechanisms, impacts, and geographic variability of sea level change? And the next column shows the different IODP uh, expeditions that were relevant to answering that question. And then there's a summary of some of the key findings, uh, such as the highly unstable West Antarctic ice sheet during the warm period of 4 million years ago is relevant to understanding potential changes in the present warming period. Next slide. Hold on, I'm having a technical glitch here. Here we go. Okay. All right, so one of the conclusions, uh, and this is the first conclusion of this section, is that the uh, Scientific Ocean Drilling Program would benefit from developing and executing a formal evaluation for assessing progress made toward achieving scientific priorities. And equally important is for communicating and sharing the program's achievements and value. Uh, my experience, my personal experience, is that there is not great communication between the ocean drilling community and those who are studying the modern ocean, and yet each could benefit from, from more exchange. I, I know I learn a lot about the current ocean uh, when I dabble into uh, IODP science, and they're, they're, uh, I'm sure others feel somewhat similarly. Now, a second conclusion is that we identified five high priority research areas which are similar to those identified by the drilling community. And I'll uh, read the bold text. So the five that we focused on are ground truthing climate change, evaluating past marine ecosystem responses to climate and ocean change, exploring the subsea floor biosphere, characterizing the tectonic evolution of the ocean basins, and monitoring uh, monitoring and assessing geohazards. We also wanted to, uh, we also spent some time on a couple of definitions that we will probably use also in the final report. The first one is vital. And so the way we use vital is that that is compelling high priority research with the potential to transform scientific knowledge of the interconnected earth system and the critical role of the ocean in that system. And there is also, we use the word urgent, which means that, that the uh, science priority is time sensitive and has, and this is most important, has immediate societal relevance to emerging challenges at regional to global scales. So of, of the high priority research areas, and those are listed in the first column, all five of them, this is how we characterize them. All we consider vital science. Two, we consider urgent science, um, and those are ground truth and climate change and geohazards both meet our definition of urgent, and evaluating marine ecosystem responses is urgent when it informs ecosystem responses of high interest. In other words, those that might occur, changes that might occur within this century or within about 100 years. Longer term changes that might come out of uh, ocean drilling studies, we don't consider urgent but they are vital, it is vital science. So I'm gonna go through the five, uh, very briefly go through the five uh, science themes that we, that we chose. Uh, this slide, the axis on the, the Y axis shows atmospheric CO2 and the X axis is a time scale, obviously not linear, that dates back as far as 600 million years ago and goes up to the present. Uh, So one of the, and this is one of the urgent high priority areas is ground truth and uh, climate change, or you could put it coring the past to inform the future. And a key objective is to test our current models of the modern ocean with their skill during warming events in the distant past. The data on this figure comes from proxies on microfossils and organic compounds. And that's the, uh, the blue data, the blue circles on the left, that's all IODP data. Uh, in the middle are ice core data, and on the end are some uh, model uh, output. And um, uh, and this builds a record of atmospheric CO2 from the distant past up to the future. The Paleoclimate Model Intercomparison Project and the Deep Time Model in Intercomparison Project use data like this for testing and evaluating calibrating system models or system models. The second, second um, 
uh, vital question that we had is has to do with monitoring and assessing geohazards. So strategically placed drilling sites across this, uh, this schematic show, showing convergent plate boundary between the subducting Philippine sea plate and the overriding Eurasian plate off the coast of Japan. It also shows where strategically placed drilling sites across this active region are shown, several of which are now instrumented borehole observatories. In other words, instruments are placed in the holes drilled by uh, a drill ship. And uh, they measure, uh, monitor deformation in the form of strain that can be used to infer fault slip. Should note that instruments and boreholes have about 10 times the sensitivity of seism seismometers placed on the surface of the seabed, leading to better resolution, in particular of slow slip seismic, seismic events. The importance of projects like this is that slow slip releases strain without a significant seismic event, whereas fast slips or seismogenic ruptures lead to, can lead to significant earthquakes and, and even tsunamis. So this slide shows some uh, uh, past marine ecosystem responses in the distant past during periods of rapid warming and how that might inform potential future changes in the modern ocean. On the left, the current ocean has a mix of large and small phytoplankton with larger phytoplankton, phytoplankton leading to more efficient energy to higher trophic levels like fish and marine mammals. The warm period of 50 million years ago was dominated by smaller phytoplankton leading to comparatively inefficient food webs, hence fewer higher trophic levels. As the ocean warms, Question is, will the efficiency of future food webs resemble those of the warmer oceans of the past? So this another another of, of our uh, vital themes is the subsea floor biosphere. So we know what's in the sea, subsea sea floor biosphere, but what is it doing? How do the communities interact and move within the subsurface? And of interest to NASA, how does the subsea subsurface biosphere and form the limits to life? And what does it contribute to the overlying water column? So this cartoon shows that the alkalinity flux shown schematically shows that the subsea floor biosphere produces about 24 to 58% of the alkalinity flux to the ocean. The fifth high priority is to characterize the evolution of ocean basins, such as the formation of oceanic crust and the upper mantle. The phases include formation at the mid-ocean ridge, which is on the left, aging as it moves away from the mid-ocean ridge, which is in the middle, and destruction at a subduction zone on the right. The oceanic plate is dark gray, continental lithosphere is brown, and the white arrows show plate motion, and white stars are large earthquakes. These dramatic stages of ocean basin creation often cannot be evidenced only by, can only be evidenced by drilling through up to one kilometer or more of sedimentation. Okay, the axes on this one, the uh, R, R, uh, five vital areas are on the left, leftmost column, and then various um, reports that, that uh, talk about national priorities for science are going across the top. And then we try to show, and what this, what this figure shows is that, um, and as an example, column three is the White House Ocean Climate Action Plan from 2023. And we show that uh, three of our, our uh, primary re research areas, the vital research areas align with that report's ocean research themes. And same for some of the other uh, reports that are that are important, that are recent, and um, outline uh, uh, key research themes for the future. We have a long table. Uh, okay, next one. We have a long table of uh, of what can and cannot be done with remaining assets, assuming the uh, JR goes away. For example. Um, I'll go down what we think. This is these are just examples. The table is quite long; it has a lot more in it. But I'll, I'll address just the ones that are on the uh, are on the slide. So, what can we do? Well, we can do community-driven, collaborative research, multidisciplinary research using existing cores. 
we can use big data analytics on a wide range of subsea floor standard measurements. We can do large scale syntheses of science studies that integrate data across multiple expeditions and boreholes, addressing global or regional geographies and time intervals. And that might be the type of thing funded by the Emerging LEAPS program. We can develop and development and testing of new proxy methods as a possibility, particularly those that are not dependent on ephemeral properties, but can be developed using existing cores. And of course, we can use the existing cores to train undergraduate and, grad and graduate students on materials and methods. But there's also a long list of what cannot be done. And that would include sample intensive high resolution studies, real time monitoring of fault motion using existing borehole instruments, microbiological and biogeochemical studies requiring fresh samples, fresh biomass, comprehensive studies of igneous and metamorphic rocks, studies of challenging rock tops, such as rock types, such as those in fault zones, analyses that depend on ephemeral properties, of poor, like the organic con content, the organic carbon content of pore waters, creation of high temporal resolution geochemical records and coordinated, new coordinated land sea studies. Also, some intervals of, of high, scientific, high scientific interest have already been sampled so extensively, leaving little material for further analyses. And this, this slide illustrates that the white areas are, of course, styrofoam that has been placed in the core, replacing the material that's been taken out for analyses. And you can see this particular interval is pretty critically important, and so it's been heavily sampled. So carbon se se sequestration, sequestration, is a current topic of considerable interest. So synthesis of existing ocean drilling data could be used to characterize subsurface rock and sediment environments conducive to storing CO2 for long periods of time. There's also possibility of using a future drill ship, perhaps a mission specific platform, to perhaps test some of the concepts that come out of analyzing the um, past strata, the strata that's already been collected. Uh, presumably, if this were to go operational, it would not require the drill ship to drill the holes uh, that would be somewhat of a waste of talent, and but that uh, that can be done by commercial ships. And then, if if it's liquid CO two, then inserted into the whole appropriate holes. Um, but certainly, some experiments could be conducted from the drill ship. So we wanted to uh, demonstrate the capabilities of the current academic research fleet. So the ODP core count which are the bars, the vertical bars uh, going up on the left, uh, going up to the top of the, of the graph. Uh, and then black on the axes, the bottom axes are the subsea floor sampling depths that can be reached from current coring infrastructure of the current academic fleet. Um, those, would, those would include some piston cores. And you can see it's quite tiny. Um, and then the blue would be if the, what used to be, the long core on the NOR is also reborn in some way so that it could be, uh, and that requires modification of an existing probably global class ship. And that's in blue. So it extends the uh, the depth a little bit. Subsea floor sampling depth is on the X axis. Yellow are subsea floor sampling depths that could be reached in some rocks and sediments with lander-based drills if that capability is developed for the academic research fleet. Our understanding is that there is no ship in the current fleet, in the U.S. fleet, academic research fleet, that can lift the uh, existing uh, 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 lander-based uh, drills. So that would either have to be developed or you'd have to use some sort of mission-specific platform. And then orange are the subsea floor sampling depths that can only be reached uh, with a drill ship. So this, this sort of summarizes the infrastructure requirements for the five uh, vital areas of research that go down, that are in the first column. And so if you track across, for example, on the first two, it shows that ground truthing of climate change needs to be, samples need to be collected in deep water in the global ocean. There has to be deep penetration into sediment and uh, in particular sediment. There are continuous records from the cores, those are required. Measurements of ephemeral properties are required. Um, 
borehole inst observatory instrumentation is not required. Logging would be good, but not absolutely required. And if you want to work in the polar regions, you need some ice strengthened uh, ship. Evaluating marine ecosystem responses to climate and ocean change requires a little bit less, but you do want to work in deep water. You do, do want deep penetration to reach, uh, say, the warm intervals 50 million years ago. Um, it would be good to have the continuous records from cores. It would be good to measure ephemeral properties. Uh, it's not necessary for a borehole instrumentation. It's not necessary for logging down core. And if you want to work in the polar regions, again, you do need to require, um, you do require some high strength in shipping. So we talk about this in the text as well, as summarized in this table. So the conclusion for this section is while there are some scientific research objectives that can be accomplished using existing assets, many science objectives critical to U.S. interests cannot be accomplished. So again, just to kind of reemphasize what um, Tuba has already mentioned, is that scientific ocean drilling is now at a critical junction. And I guess one simple way to, um, to summarize it up if there is no U.S. drill ship, the Japanese drill ship works only in their waters, and ECORD has sponsored only a small number of MSPs. So for the foreseeable future, only the Chinese will have the capability to drill deep below the sediment surface, surface throughout the global ocean. Next slide. So these are the next steps. The uh, report is now released. Uh, there's another, there's a congressional briefing uh, tomorrow. Uh, hard copies will be out soon. And um, we're continuing to gather information. We're making full, we're making progress on the full report, which will contain recommendations covering all of ocean science, including ocean drilling. And that report will be out in about a year. Uh, we, I guess we'll go right on, go right on to the questions. And uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you, Jim and Tuba. Um, so that they provided a very high level um, overview. I, you know, I know most of you probably haven't had a chance to even download the report yet, but I encourage you to do so. There's there's a lot of detail um, in there you can't cover in thirty minutes. Um, so we have plenty of time for questions. Um, Please don't be shy to enter your questions into the Q&A. Um, while we wait for some to populate, um, I have a question that, um, <laughs> that, I, that I think many of you would like to answer. Um, so I, it's really concerning the you know, societally relevant questions that, that these um, that scientific drilling can answer. I was wondering if you could speak more to examples such as the AMOC. Um, that, you know, everyone can relate to and that this is so important in terms of um, really trying to understand and predict. Well, I could say very quickly that uh, that is an extremely interesting thing. There's IODP has made some contributions about how AMOC has changed in the past, and there's a lot of interest in big measurement programs to look at the current situation. And uh, so it is a very hot topic. Uh, I'm sure we'll have more to say about it in the final report. Others that know more about it than I do are welcome to jump in. Would anyone else on the committee like to touch on this question? Uh, I can uh, say yeah. something. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Chase. <laughs> go ahead. Brad, Chase, go you... ahead. I'll let you go. <laughs> <laughs> So as, as somebody who, who directly works in the in the AMOC space, uh, yeah, it's it's very certain that you'll you'll hear more in the in the wider oceans context about present work being done around the AMOC, and uh, that's both direct observational work and modeling work. But much of the modeling work has been informed by the paleo perspective that comes from the ocean drilling program. And so the awareness of the sensitivity of the AMOC has partly come, substantially come from these paleo observations. They highlighted the potential for the collapse of the AMOC that we're now still trying to understand. And so that past perspective 
will continue to be important as we dig further into it, but it was one of the initial drivers of, uh, of our whole present concern around this uh, potential for the collapse of the global circulation. Jay-Z, I'll let you go. I just I'm muting. Yeah, I was just I'm muting myself. Yeah, and just just uh, to sort of build on what uh, Brad was saying was that <clears throat> you know our perspective on what the ocean circulation uh, can do uh, has been informed um, by observations of the past, and so just twenty thousand years ago, uh, it's clear that the ocean circulation was operating in a different mode, um, and that's something that was discovered actually a few decades ago and, and, and encouraged the physical oceanography community uh, to trust their models, which were showing these sort of mode flips. Uh, and um, the thing that they also noticed was that these were fairly fast. And again, this is something that's been verified by uh, past observations. Going further back in time um, into the greenhouse intervals, we also see different modes of circulation and also evidence to suggest that uh, there have been these sort of uh, mode switches, and again, uh, that they occur fairly quickly. Uh, we don't know all the details of some of the um, changes that have occurred in deeper time, but that's you know, something that has been a focus of <clears throat> current and proposed um, um, drilling uh, going out forward. So. Thank you, Daisy and Brad and Jim for those answers. Um, we have quite a few uh, questions now in the chat. Um, I just wanted to touch, um, there's a clarification about the Japanese drilling vessel Chippy from Nobu and Gucci. Thank you, Nobu. Um, and that they can work out of Japanese water. Um, it's just a, a question or an issue of budget. So thanks for that clarification. Um, there is another question which we have, we will get, I think, a few times, and that's regarding recommendations. Um, so the committee was really focused on their statement of task, which was what are the remaining science priorities that can only be answered with scientific ocean drilling? And of those science priorities, you know, what sort of infrastructure is needed? What can we what can we answer with what we have and what can't we answer with what we have? So we did stop there. Um, in terms of recommendations, um, our, our full report will have some recommendations for the next decade of ocean sciences. And we did not want to get ahead of ourselves in making recommendations without considering um, the full breadth of, of scientific research questions you know, over ocean sciences. So it was very deliberate um, and in response to our statement of class. And um, we look forward to releasing that report in about a year's time. Um, let's see. So here's another question from Mitch Lyle. One of the real strengths of the ocean drilling program has been the international participation. Is there any recommendation how to continue the international participation? Any recommendations or, or findings, conclusions? Jim, I think you're muted. Well, I could, I could start the answer, but others can jump in. Um, yeah, that is a real strength of IODP was the uh, all the international participation and the fact that some of the facilities are located in Germany, Japan, and so on. And um, I, I suspect we'll consider international participation, international collaboration, cooperation for the whole field of ocean science when we get to it, including ocean drilling. And um, I know that's kind of a general wishy-washy answer, but um, uh, maybe others want to jump in on this. Right. Maybe maybe I'll just add, I mean, the committee really was impressed with, and we spoke quite a bit about the unique nature of how the scientific ocean drilling program was run. Um, the international aspect is one of them, but also the way in which students are entrained into cruises is unique and special. Um, and so we were, those of us who have not been on IODP cruises were very impressed with um, the approach. And so one of the things that we did talk about is was how some of those approaches can actually be ported to just generally ocean going work, um, not just drilling related, because there's certainly very successful aspects of this program that ought to live on no matter what. 
Kristen. Ellie, can, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, with regard to international collaboration, one thing that we did emphasize in chapter four, there's a section on communicating the worth. And um, we have throughout the report bold statements that are the findings that are, um, you know, in addition to these kind of broader conclusions. And one of our findings is specifically about the importance of interdisciplinary networks and collaborations across multiple disciplines. And we see that this is essential to the vital and also the additionally urgent science that we've prioritized. So the emphasis is there. How to get to that is um, you know, a, a very challenging situation given the, the state that we're at right now and staying within our statement of task of laying out here are the challenges, here are the infrastructure, here are the workforce needs that that must be addressed or need to be addressed. That that's kind of where what we could do with this report. Making recommendations is what we can do with the next report, but that also will be integrated across all of ocean science. And um, you know, as Jim mentioned in in his part of the presentation, um I, I, I agree with him, he was making a personal comment, but I agree with this. Uh, the benefits of working across disciplines and working outside of our silos cannot be understated. This is something that the program has been very um, dedicated to in the past and the benefits within the drilling program, but also within the broader ocean sciences of working in a multidisciplinary and um, you know, across career stages, wherever we're located and disciplines is, is something that's valued. Kelly, can I jump in? There's a question um, about um, other capabilities um, from Chris Lowry about, um, you know, capabilities of hiring geotechnical vessels or drilling platforms. Um, we do have a section in our report where we talk about emerging technologies and what they can help us accomplish. Um, so uh, please do look at that detail. Um, I think it's within chapter four, uh, but we also point out what can still not be accomplished even with um, what we believe were, would be realistic new technologies that could be invested in. Thank you, Cuba. Um, there is a question about the congressional briefing that I can answer very quickly. Um, that is a courtesy. Um, this is not congressionally mandated study, but as a courtesy, we do offer briefings to congressional staff who are interested. Um, that is, that's all it is. Um, so it will be similar to this. And um, we may have two people, and we may have 20. <laughs> uh, we never know. Uh, it depends on what's going on in the Hill that day. Um, let's see. So I think there's several questions about um, the international aspect, but I think we've just answered that um, through the other questions or through the other answers. Um, I see a question from Anthony Coppers about the list of cannots being much longer than can do. Um, is your opinion how much this does this negatively alter the state of ocean sciences in the US? Um, does this set us back significantly? Is there any anyone want to answer that in in the um, through the lens of what we said in the report? Right. I think it is pretty clear that um, that with the retirement of the JR, that the U.S. will lose its leadership position in this realm. Um, I think we we make that pretty clear uh, in the report. Um, that is, of course, an unfortunate situation from our perspective, um, but um, it, it it is something that that we try to really stress. Um, anyone want to add to that? Yeah, sure, if I may. Um, following up on Tuba's point, uh, Anthony, you're right, the list of the cannots is a lot longer than the, the cans, but because our charge is not to make a recommendation, we did not feel comfortable taking that next step that you ask us specifically for, but we feel, as Tuba pointed out, it should be uh, that we laid out our interpretation of the facts and figures of what can and cannot be done and let the reader and the agency decide whether that is significant or not. So we hope that the presentation 
speaks for itself um, without making you know such a recommendation at this interim uh, report stage. Yeah, and I guess Rick, I'll just follow up and stress again that we really um, paid attention to making sure that we adhered to our statement of task. Um, and, and we, we took that responsibility very seriously. And, and not just because that is the rule of the National Academies, but also because we do believe that now we that now that we've done the work towards the interim report and we can look at the ocean science priorities broadly across the entirety of the ocean sciences community, it is only then that we can make balanced recommendations that 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 really view the entire landscape. Um, but I will also add that I certainly have done, have learned a lot through the work that we've did, done on the interim report, and that that more in-depth understanding that we, I think all of us have attained, will certainly be carried into the work that we're doing for the final report. Can I, can I also add, um, really, I think Anthony's question and the responses we've heard so far to it circle back to the point that Tuba made at the, the beginning of the presentation that the capacity is going to be reduced to 10% of the current capacity for scientific ocean drilling. And yeah, you know, the, the can'ts are a lot longer than the cans. And, and this is this is where we're seeing sort of the loop closing in the conversation. And so, you know, moving forward, there are going to be very important decisions that need to be made. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks, everyone, for the, all of the clarifications. Um, there's one clarification in the chat um, saying the JR itself is, is not retiring, just retiring um, its role, its current role in the drilling program. Thank you, Emily, for that clarification. Um, there are, let's see. Um, Kelly, I see a, a question about early career scientists. Can we take that yeah. one? Sure, of course. Right, and, and uh, folks, I think everybody can see the questions. So this question is really about the importance of this work to early career scientists. And, um, you know, if we don't have a drill ship or if we, even at the short cessation of uh, scientific ocean drilling will essentially result in a brain drain, right? Those folks will have to work on something else and may not return. And and this is a real risk that, that we talked through as a committee and also included in our report. Jim, did you have something to add to that too? Well, I'm just hoping that uh, this LEAPS program fills some of that. You know, at least I think you could engage younger scientists on more analyses of existing forests, even though, you know, that's that's a probably not exciting as going out and getting new ones going out on a ship and so on, but, but hopefully that could help bridge that gap. And, you know, I don't think NSF has ruled out the possibility of operating mission specific platforms. And so that's, perhaps a possibility for the future as well. Yeah. Um, there is a question from Claire Jasper about um, recommendations to improve collaboration between ocean drilling and the broader science, ocean science community. This is a really important point that we did try to stress in our report and, and we touched upon in, in our presentation too, Jim spoke to this point. Um, we find we, we think it is extremely important that the broader ocean sciences community and the ocean drilling community uh, integrate and do that handshake. Um, there is a lot of potential for a real societal benefit that can come from being better at connecting across those boundaries. Um, and also uh, the section that Kristen referred to, communicating the worth, really, um, if, really bringing the understanding that this work um, you know, this work enables us to, to attain, bringing that understanding to other communities, both within the scientific community, as well as the broader community. We felt that that, that was something that we needed to spend more time on. May, may, I, may I add to that? Um, I want to add a, a personal perspective from being part of this committee. Um, I have learned so much and, and have have embraced this opportunity to work with people across the ocean sciences. I've, I'm a trained geological oceanographer, and I think most of the people who are on this, um, most of the attendees right now are probably in that realm as well with experience with scientific ocean drilling. But the opportunity to connect with and work with and have discussions with and debates with um, 
experts across the ocean sciences that are working in different areas and time frames has been invaluable. And, and we're a microcosm, I think, of what Claire is raising as an important issue going forward. So I'm glad that you raised that point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, are there, so we have, we have a, a, about eight more minutes. Um, please, if, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, there's a couple comments in here. Um, um, and there's there's been several comments about the opportunities to collaborate with research in the US and international. Is there anything more that um, that you all would like to comment on? on that specifically. Yeah, I see a comment um, in the Q&A um, uh, from Sergio, who says that they work for BP. Um, so that, um, yes, industry, uh, I'm so glad that you all you are here. Um, and certainly, uh, it, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about industry collaborations. But that's a great point that you've brought up. Um, there is kind of a technical question um, from Kuan Yu Lin. What is the current capability of physical property logging of existing deep legacy holes? Um, do any of you know the answer to that off the top? I would refer that question to the current operators at Texas A&M who will have the very latest uh, um, facts and figures and specifications of, of current operations. Thank you. Just want to comment on the international. I, I think the IODP model, where um, uh, joint, uh, uh, you know, a cooperative group of international scientists can propose expeditions, is an interesting one. And you know, perhaps that could be adopted to some extent in the, uh, you know, in, but and more more adopt, more common in the academic fleet um, for basic oceanographic studies. It's something to think about as we as we move on to the next report. Thank you, Jen. Um, there's a question here from, from um, Anthony Coppers about the urgency of the, um, of the science priorities that we listed, ground truthing, climate change, and the geohazards. Um, at what urgent time scales do you see we need for the future scientific ocean drilling solution? I, I can um, start that answer. Um, I think the the graph that I think Jim was showing, looking at CO two versus time, uh, time scales that help inform those those models for the near future, I think are what we're looking or is where is where the committee was finding consensus. So looking at climate as well as ecosystem dynamic changes, um, how scientific ocean drilling can inform the modeling that's projecting for, for the near future with the various scenarios. So I, I think that would be a reasonable um, a way right. to approach this. Well, though maybe Anthony is more asking about the urgency of the solution. Oh, what, my, my apologies. At what time scales do you see we need a, for a future um, scientific ocean drilling solution? Um, I think the, the urgency is real. Yes. Yeah, we were very careful and deliberate in defining vital and urgent. These were not, um, you know, just flippant. Oh, let's, these are, these are neat terms. Like this, this was given serious deliberation and urgency means what we think when we use that term urgent, this, this, this has societal relevance and there are critical issues facing society right now and in the very near future. Thank you. Um, Kelly, there is this clarification about the LEAPS program. LEAPS is a pilot project that will expire with this phase of IODP. Um, so thank you for that input. Um, that is good to, uh, um, well, not good to hear, but that is important to, to absorb. Um, and the report does include um, ideas around uh, the LEAPS, current LEAPS program um, 
and so or also maybe that can serve as a basis for potentially a future. Mm -hmm. I believe that we phrased it as uh, if a funded leads could be valuable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, there, there was a comment from John Orcutt, um, and he has his hand raised. Um, I think I can allow you to talk, John. So um, give it a try. Hi, uh, John Orcutt. Uh, I see Jim Yoder's there. Um, we worked on drilling programs for for decades. Um, in my experience extends there well to the left. Um, what you have, but one of the one of the things that we can do now that was not possible before was uh, moving real time data from the seafloor to uh, people um, everywhere. Literally, that used to involve cables, but anymore it can be done. Um, with acoustics um, and uh, acoustic modems to uh, to move data back and forth and actually command things uh, remotely at the uh, site itself. I'm a seismologist, so that's and geodesist. Um, we have a lot of work going on in the oceans now with geodesy, um, making periodic uh, measurements along the uh, Cascadia several a few times each year to monitor movement and so on but the these kinds of technologies are available to the drilling program and it probably should be um well it should be more apparent than it is in and i i haven't i don't have a copy in the most recent report but i i um i think that there are technologies that could be taken advantage of um if you had the capability yep thank that's, you that's john that's all i had um, Mark, uh, can you comment on that yeah yeah john that's that's a great point and i i would just say that we we in the report actually in the discussion of um geohazards in particular we focused on this fact not just in terms of looking at the geologic record of you know you can get frequency of past events, but really focusing also on the borehole observatories and their importance for informing um, monitoring of, for example, subduction zone systems um, in the future. So I so that was that was that is <clears throat> highlighted in the report, and I completely agree that that's a really important issue, and it's obviously super societally relevant thinking about Cascadia and, and other subduction zone areas where you can get tsunamigenic earthquake sequences. Yeah, thank you, Mark. I know, Kelly, we just have a couple of minutes, but there was a, a last question that came in just now that I do want to address since it relates to something I said earlier regarding communication between IODP oceanographers and non-IODP oceanographers. Um, and I, I can give you an example. For example, um, you know, I learned that that some of the IODP data is important to ground truthing sea level rise projections. You know, I'm not an IODP scientist, but I am. A, um, a, my research pertains to modeling and projecting into the future. Um, and when I looked that dove into the literature about uh, you know literature around uh, sea level rise modeling. Um, I saw some evidence that IODP uh, data was taken in, uh, in, into consideration, but it felt like there was a lot more potential there. And so that tells me that we need to make sure that that the, the data that's collected and then the information that's garnered, that we really communicate that across that, you know, seemingly short divide, but nonetheless, that that, that information really gets brought to bear on the the projections that we currently are relying on, um, I think I think I personally think we can do um, we can do more in that in that realm. And if anyone wants to add to that or subtract from that, please feel free. Um, Thank you, too. Just, uh, yeah, I just, just see if I can add to that. And this is a very personal perspective. Just want to put that there. Um, but um, Jason, you're a perfect example of someone who does both. Um, but our understanding from listening to a lot of the uh, comments that we have gotten and the presentations we heard was that IODP science is IODP science and everything else is everything else. And it's that crosstalk, you know, so the same person does both, but it seems like that crosstalk is what might be improved. And that's essentially what we're trying to get at with that recommendation. 
Yeah. yeah, and I, th I think it was a really, really good thing to have that special issue of oceanography about IODP. I mean, that's that's off that journal is tend, tends to be read by uh, people working in the modern ocean, and to see the summary of some of the IODP IODP findings was really a positive thing to help with the communication. All right, and, and thank you, everyone. Um, there are a couple more comments. Um, Jamie Austin, I see your, your comments about communicating um, the urgency to Congress. Um, we have that opportunity tomorrow. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and thanks everyone for all the, the thoughtful questions. Um, we are now out of time. We've been a minute over. Apologize for that. Um, and uh, but yeah, thanks for joining us today. Thanks um, to Ben and Jim for talking through this and the committee for being on the line to help with questions. Um, as you read the report, if you have other questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, we are still available. Um, and we're still doing a lot of, of work towards that larger report. So the communication um, doorway is open. Um, and uh, just again, thank you for your attention today. Um, and have a, have a wonderful Wednesday. Thanks, everybody.